So it is the 12th of um, July and it's 3.30. My name is Benson, thanks for tuning in. I um, have quite a bit to tell you, but I've also got to keep my attention on the road. So I'm going to, um, I had to resort to doing a vlog <coughs> because the blog that didn't want to be written <coughs> I tried <coughs> three times to write and every time <coughs> there was an obstacle the biggest of which was ESCOM <coughs> I sat down on Monday morning with every intention of getting it planned it carefully in my head and then started putting it all together onto WordPress. 274 words into my attempt I get a notification via the domestic worker Cynthia that in 10 minutes we would lose power but I lost power at that very moment that she said it to me. All focus was gone. How do you suddenly conjure up words knowing that you're going to be without power? It's never happened to me before where I lost focus because of not having power. How are you affected by it? Can you <coughs> carry on? Can you go through your normal day? Can you negotiate those two hours? Maybe that should be the first chapter. That two hours of powerlessness. I am, um, instead of sitting down and trying to force myself to do an online blog, I, I always am a, that sort of person where I, I figure there must be something else that wants to get done in the absence of power. Something that, that's more physical, something that's more outdoorsy, that doesn't require ESCOM. And um, I was very lucky, I am very lucky in the sense that my day is made up of a number of activities. And there's some f physical activities that don't require power. So that's what I decided to do. And. Um, I ended up um, going for a short walk to a neighbor's place and spent a good chunk of the powerlessness time chatting and networking and selling a product to her. So it's, it's that sort of activity that we're not wired up and we don't need to be wired up to, to be able to do talking as well as reading. So I want to um, deviate very energetically into this next space and say to you that I have never been in this situation before where I'm reading two books at the same time by the same author located in the same place. Deline Mathie has passed on. Her writing is exquisite. I get lost in her words, in the way she describes things. And I think forest writing is a thing. She describes forests like I almost am there, I can touch the wood. So we've been house sitting, and that's a segue which I'm going to avoid. But because of the house sit, I end up with two. Deline Matthews Maffei's books. One is The Mulberry Tree and the other one is um, Villa Sekant. Now, those of you that have been following my social media activities, you know that I'm not just reading Villa Sekant. Villa Sekant. I'm not trying to find the Kant. I'm trying to find the K word. I will send, put the link in now. You can go here to go and get the full story of the cable. So, 
during lockdown I spend half an hour reading one book the Marbury 3 and then I put it down and instead of making a cup of tea I go and drink a glass of water and then for the next half an hour <coughs> I read Phyllis <coughs> which is uh, the second half of the first hour of the two hours of Eskom. <coughs> Stay with me. I am... Um, there, was, there was another obstacle that prevented me from writing. And that obstacle is the title of this blog post. Caring and nurturing and in some case planting the family tree. My dad, he was one of ten and he famously says that they ended up being nine. <coughs> of the few that were left, <coughs> my dad being one of those that had passed on ten plus years ago, we buried his elder brother on a Saturday post. Besides the usual hugging and kissing and crying that happens at the funeral, <coughs> I'm gonna have to pause this one. So we try again. <coughs> I've got some sinus side effects left over. So Hence the coughing and the spluttering and the sneezing. But the thing that I want to say to you is that I drove back from the funeral with one thought in mind, an overwhelming thought, overpowering thought, the thought of thoughts. And that is that my dad, <coughs> Joey Ardenser, and his brother, Freddie Ardenser, they would join at the hip. There were a couple of years between them and there was there's this another story there, but the main thing is they were the keeper of secrets in the family. The fixer of things, the guy, the go-to guys when things go wrong. But they also kept the family secrets. One secret that my two secrets, two secrets that my dad shared with me. One secret came when I was about 12 and there was an uncle called Adam and we had his 21st party and that was the usual celebration where you get given a key and on this particular day before the party started, we as kids were called together around the table and an announcement was made <clears throat> and it went something like this. Children, we just have to tell you that your uncle, uh, Adam, who's turning 21 today, is not actually your uncle, he's your brother. And make us a cup of coffee. Would have been my dad's kind of way of dealing with things. So we got up, we sat down <coughs> with an uncle turning 21, and I got up to make coffee with a thought that I have a brother that I've never known before, that I never knew I had. I thought it was just me. That was the first secret. The second secret is that of the 10 brothers, of the ten siblings, five of them have one um, father, while the rest of them have another one. And those two fathers are brothers. There's <coughs> a biblical story of a woman's husband dying and the brother moving in and taking her as his own. <coughs> and that's kind of what happened in, our, in, in that space. But I suddenly came up with a thought 
that if this is true, if this is one of the skeletons in our cupboard as Arden's family, <coughs> if it is true, what were the conditions that made him go? He went somewhere and he probably went to another family and he probably had another wife and other kids. So then I have other cousins that I don't know of who are not part of the family tree. Some time ago, a friend of mine, a neighbor friend of mine, well, let's just call him an acquaintance, he found out about my love for trees. And he called me over and invited me over to drink at his house. I'd never seen the front of his garden before. I took one look at it and realized that that's, that's where my friendship ends. Without even... I would be embarrassed to ask a friend to cut down a monstrous tree that's taken up the whole garden. Massive big palm tree. This is what my family tree represents for me in this last two weeks. That's all I could think about. Who are we connected to? And what about those who are not connected? How do we find them? So I'm going to end there with that chapter. There's two more to go. Let me done. <laughs> Yeah, so the model of that family tree story is this. only do it if you can be confronted with your own skeletons and untold stories. I am um, got two more to go and then I think we should wrap it up. I am um, I'm still apologizing for vlogging when I should be blogging but whichever way um, stories have got to be told truth has got to get out and um, it's the truth that will set us free if scripture is to be believed to be believed I have got two more chapters to go I want to show you something a car part that has wrecked my life absolutely and I'm trying to remember the exact wording of it but there's a little chasechda a little expression metaphor that says to buy cheaply is to buy expensive something like remember the Afrikaans expression. I went about a month ago I found my car not doing very well and I found out that um, so this little chapter has got to do with the fact that we will be paying more for petrol and um, some tips that I thought I would share with you. The first tip is obvious if you can't do it, you've got to get someone else who can do it. And I'm talking about a mechanic. And <clears throat> Joey was his own mechanic. He used to fix things. But then he also had lots of mechanic friends. And that's me. I've got two. And I'm going to say this to you. If you are listening to this and you need the services of either... Let me know and I'll have you. You can have their number. My number one is a guy who is hard to find. He's very busy and he costs. My number two is a guy that used to sleep in his garage, drank lots of beer, smoked lots of dope, got the job done. And it was my number two I went to to get some advice because number one yeah, I didn't have the money for number one 
So number two his advice was go down to the to the spare shop, get a petrol pump, and I'll fit it for you for 200 rand. I bought this and it was the worst thing I could have done. This that I've just showed you is a genetic petrol pump. It cost me 500 bucks and myself. As soon as I had it fitted, literally days after a few things started happening. One of the things is that it would sometimes start and it would sometimes not. I spent more time walking with cans of jerry cans of petrol than I spent driving. A bad buy is what I was experiencing. Up until I could take it no more. In fact, the car broke down on me. The new pump stopped working the new pump stopped working I went back to my number one my number one drove out to me one morning rainy morning pulled out the new pump and went and bought a proper pump and had it fitted and now I've got to drive and talk to you so that my battery charged again because one of the side effects from this is my battery ran out so in order to save money you got to spend money and have two mechanics would be my tip lastly <coughs> this view from the streets I I just come back from um, Fisher police station there were two guys I needed to see about two separate things, both of them homeless. The, the non-profit that I've registered has got homelessness wrapped in there somewhere, but not explicit. I am their friend, but today I became Marius's pastor. Marius is well known on the WhatsApp groups of the neighborhood Watch Fisher because he's angry, because he's drug dependent. And then, through some miraculous intervention from the SAP, he was arrested. I have a sense that he needs to be psychologically evaluated and put into care. So I presented myself to the SAP as his pastor. I hope that next time I sit down at the computer, I will have something positive to say about Marius, the angry, tick addicted, marvelous person. Terence O'Shea, the last little chapter, and for those who need to know, he was on the streets, he went into rehab, he's off, he's off out of rehab, he's on the streets again doing what he was doing before. And for some reason, my number always gets wrapped up. So I got called by his mum, and his mum desperately wanted to make contact with him. So I went out looking for him today because there's some money coming his way and while I went looking and walking and asking on the same path and then I also realized that that's a skill to contact the uncontactable eventually we found him I let him listen to all the many voice notes that she sent me and we meet again tomorrow I'm hoping that I can create employment for him hoping that I can create temporary employment for Marius. I'm hoping that I can create partnerships that can facilitate employment under the name of Symmetries. I'm very, very happy for your company. I just hope that this battery is charged.